As Barna and I were getting ready to leave Colorado Springs, she was stationed at Fort Carson, and I had just graduated pretty much from seminary. I had a couple more classes that I was going to take online and then fly back and forth. So we're leaving Fort Carson. We're staying at this Double Tree Hotel that's kind of near Fort Carson. Mara takes the car to go do out processing, so she's going to be gone all day, and I'm stuck alone at the Double Tree. I mean, that's not such a bad place to be stuck, obviously, but you know, I'm stuck. I don't have a car. And I all of a sudden had this real jonesing for a McDonald's sausage biscuit. <laughs> had to have a sausage, I mean, I do that maybe once a year. They're not good for me. But I had to have a sausage biscuit for McDonald's. But to get to the McDonald's, I had to walk down onto the sidewalk. And the hotel was right, I'm going to show you a picture of this in a minute. The hotel was right by Interstate 25, and I had to walk across some curves and through some uh, crosswalks and go underneath the overpass of Interstate 25. I don't know if you've ever actually walked in an area like that. But you know what? It's a world that's very different. It was very different for me. I was really out of place, and it was kind of scary. And as I looked under the underpass, over uh, the overpass, and started to walk that way, I saw her sitting on that, you know those shelves? Uh, under an overpass, you've got the steep embankment and there's like a shelf kind of up there. She was sitting there. We'll get back to her in a minute. Call this trading places. We'll see how Jesus trades places with this person called a leper. Can I get one more slide, Kate? If there's one thing that Jesus hates is social constructs. And we all have social we, human constructs, social constructs. What are social constructs? Social constructs are things that we make up in our humanness to classify other human beings, usually to proclaim our superiority or difference. He's black, she's gay, he's Muslim. They're poor, he's rich, she's disabled, he has, you know, whatever it is. And it's one of the things that actually makes Jesus really angry. He actually gets angry. And if you think about our religion, I was talking with a friend of mine by email a couple, it was this week, and we were talking about Jesus, and he said, you know, I think God waited until we were ready to send Jesus. We obviously weren't ready, but as we got into the conversation, I said, do you think the people really were ready back then, 2,000 years ago, for Jesus and his message of inclusion? And we came to the conclusion, no, they weren't ready because they killed him. And then I thought, are we ready today for the message of Jesus? Most of Christianity really isn't, if you think about it, because most of Christianity is about our differences. You believe the right thing, you don't believe the right thing. You are on the rights of, 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 of an army chaplain told Martin just this week, when are you Episcopalians going to get on the right side of Scripture? For heaven's sakes, we're not even sure y'all are saved. <laughs> and if you think about it, we really aren't ready for the all-inclusive message of Jesus. We still spend a lot of time with these constructs. Can I get one more good? <laughs> what should I think about that passage from Leviticus, if you will? This man is called a leper. The New International Version says a man with leprosy. But that's not what it says in the Greek. It says a leper. If you think about it, if you were this person, this person's entire identity is wrapped up in their disease. They don't exist other than their disease. You're a leper. What does that mean for your life? Can you imagine waking up in the morning and putting on your shirt or whatever back then, and you looked down and you saw a little spot on your skin? Imagine the panic that might cause you. You probably want to hide it. Because you would know, if it spreads and turns into something, into leprosy, you have to live on the outside of the village. You can never have human touch again. Your family, you can't see your family. People that look at you turn their head. They're disgusted. People, you have to scream unclean, cover your head in rags. Talk about misery. Talk about loneliness. Talk about shame. What a horrible way to live. It's not life. I, I, who 
for our lepers today. I mean, we still have lepers today if you think about it. And so the man is forced to live outside of the community. People were so freaked out by leprosy back then, as a matter of fact, that they thought that if a leper walked past you and the sun was shining in just the right way and the leper's shadow touched you, that you could get leprosy. Can you imagine the lengths that people went to to run away from people with leprosy? So he's on the outside of the circle. I, I saw quite a few pictures of people with leprosy. You can look it up yourself if you want to look at images. And it's a horribly disfiguring disease. This man has leprosy. Um, what was going on in his mind as he went up to Jesus? I imagine, I imagine maybe he was sarcastic when he said to Jesus, if you want to, you can heal me. Maybe because he's got to protect something in his heart. Is this going to be yet another crushing disappointment? Can this man actually heal the way people say he can heal? Is there a pregnant pause in between when he asks Jesus to heal him that maybe only lasts half a second, but to the man lasts an eternity before Jesus looks at him and reaches out? Is Jesus going to see me? Is he going to see me? Or is he going to avert his eyes in disgust? And run away. Jesus does two things that break down these social constructs. Jesus doesn't turn his eyes. Jesus looks at him. And if you think about it, Jesus may be the first person that has looked at this man since he was afflicted with lovers. He actually sees him. And then he goes one farther. He actually touches him. He may not have had a human being touch him in years. And then Jesus heals him. Can I get one more, Kate? But of course the healing is not just leprosy going away on his skin. By listening to him, seeing him, and healing him, he has now restored his human dignity. He has restored his part in the community. He can have another human being touch him again. He can go home. What an amazing, Jesus has given him back his life. You think about it. Yeah, Jesus has given him back his life. So here's the double tree. So there's the parking lot. You gotta walk down onto that sidewalk onto Lake Avenue. And I gotta get from Lake Avenue across where that red line is up there. And then underneath, this is actually I-25. And I'm going underneath that overpass. And she was sitting there smoking a cigarette. And I told you before, not every single human being that you see on the side of the road is safe. I don't, I don't advocate that you go pick up every person on the side of the road, bring them into your house or whatever. I told you I struggled with the man who erected the tent down from Marta's apartment. I really struggled. What do I do? In this case, it was do I turn around in fear and go back and I don't get my sausage biscuit? <laughs> or do I go ahead and walk and maybe, maybe I'll just walk past her and she won't say anything and I won't say anything and everything will be cool. I get my sausage biscuit and come back. But no, I start walking past. She's got her cigarette. She says, hey, how's it going? <laughs> and I had a choice. I could just go, hey, and keep walking. I don't know why I did. But I turned to her and I said, this time, I said, I'm good. How are you? And she put her cigarette out, kind of stumbles down. I'm like, oh, jeez. <laughs> I just said, hey. But she came down and she started talking to me. I found out her name was Debbie. She wasn't homeless. 
she lived with her sister and her husband in a trailer, in a trailer park that was right past the McDonald's, excuse me. She had to leave during the day though because her sister and her husband pretty much drank all day and screamed at each other. And she couldn't stand to be in the trailer with them. She had a mental breakdown. Her ex-husband had taken her daughter away from her. And she was just mentally and physically at the end of her rope. And I just listened to her because it was all I could do. And I offered to buy her a sausage biscuit. <laughs> and she said, that would be nice. And I started to walk away. She didn't want to go. And I said, I'll be right back. And she said, you know what? You've just given me the biggest gift I have ever been given. And I said, oh, really? She said, you see me. You see me. You looked at me. You didn't turn your head away. Everyone that sees me, when I walk up to the gas station to buy a pack of cigarettes, everyone seems to run away. No one will look at me. But you see me. We have an awesome power given to us by God, I believe. I don't know about you. I don't have the power to reach out and touch someone and heal their physical infirmities. I don't know about you. But we all have the power to treat other people with dignity and to see them and to listen to them. The greatest gift you can give another human being on this planet is to actually sit down and look at them and actively listen to what they're saying without judgment. It's the greatest gift you can give another human being. And I believe that it's divinely inspired and given to us by the Holy Spirit. We have to make a choice to use that. I came back and she was gone. And I, of course I never saw her again because we moved uh, to South Carolina for a while. But she said that I gave her a gift. And I believe that. But you know what? She gave me a gift too because she saw me as well. I felt transformed. I know I only had two sauces of biscuits. <laughs> Well, I didn't. <laughs> but she had seen me as well. And I felt transformed. I felt renewed. I felt affirmed as well. Okay, can I get one more? This is ministry. This is ministry. Too much of our religion thinks that ministry is the purview of the person preaching in the pulpit. It's the clergy. No, one of the things that drew me to this church, I've told you, and Marta has told you again, yes, for a time, the pastor here is the Reverend Charles Conway, but the ministers are the congregation. You're the minister. You're, you're the ones with the power and the gift to transform people's lives. This is ministry. I didn't ask her, are you saved? I didn't ask her, do you trust and believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I didn't ask her where she goes to church, I didn't ask her uh, any of those questions. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? I didn't ask her if I could pray over her. I just listened. And it's something we can all do. I love this slide. I'm not sure who, who said this. But we all have the power to build up or to tear down. We have the ability, God-given ability, to love our neighbor and love ourselves and to affirm others. And by the Holy Spirit, we have the power to do this with people that we meet along our life's journey. This is the meaning of life for me. It's what I aspire to do. I'm not always able to do it, but this is what I believe ministry is. Listening to other human beings through the power of the Holy Spirit, affirming each other, loving our neighbor and loving ourselves and loving 